Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar um, entitled Chennai City of a Thousand Tanks. Um, just for some admin, uh, please keep your, your video and yourselves mute throughout the call just to prevent any feedback. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the group chat and we will relay them to the speakers. Um, so yes, welcome. Uh, today is the third session of the webinar series for the Water as Leverage Resilience in Asian Deltas. My name is Lauren Aranta. I'm part of the Water Youth Network. Um, just a little bit of background. The Water Youth Network is a global connector in the water sector, made up of vibrant community of students and young professionals across disciplines. Uh, we as the Water Youth Network aim to connect young professionals and students in the water sector in one way or another and to empower young leaders to create and take forward sustainable solutions in the water sector. Today we have uh, three speakers with us um, who are involved in the City of a Thousand Tanks project. Um, so first is Eva Fans, for our, who's the co-founder and director of Ooze Architects and Urbanists. Um, Nolifa Tadjudin, uh, who's an architect from Ooze Architects and Urbanists and Hilesh Hari Haran from uh, Madras Terrace, who's a principal architect based in Chennai. Um, welcome and enjoy today's session. Lauren, um, should I just start by sharing the screen? Uh, yes, you can. You you should be able to. Perfect. We can see. Okay, so uh, welcome. Thanks for joining everybody. Very excited to share with you what we, what our findings are uh, of our work in Chennai that has been going on now for um, more than two years. The City of Thousand Tanks project is part of the Water is Leverage project of the Dutch government that was started by the Dutch um, water envoy, Henk Oving, together with the Dutch Middle Enterprise Agency. Um, it started as an open call to which we participated in a big group that you can see here on the screen that involves various multidisciplinary um, participants from the net, mainly from the Netherlands and from Chennai. And so working together, obviously, with engineering uh, mm -hmm. firms, we are for nature-based solutions, we're working with universities such as CU Delft and IIT Madras, um, and we're working with NGOs such as Care Earth Trust and also cultural institutions such as the Goethe Institute. So now I would like to start to talk about um, the project. We are here in the Southeast Indian region. You see here um, Chennai, uh, you see all the watersheds of India, and you can see that they mostly go into the Bay of Bengal. They heat up during, during covering, like going over the land, and then it all comes down in um, monsoon, rains um, only uh, two months a year. And so floods and droughts were the main problem that we had to deal with. Is there a way to mute the sound of somebody coming in? Or? Um, unfortunately, I think it's because I've made you a co-host. Um, I can okay. withdraw your co-host permission and maybe it'll stop and hopefully you can still share your ah, screen. So only I can hear it, yeah. Yeah, only you you and other, other co-hosts can hear it. Now, okay, so. so maybe, yeah, you can. Yep, I think Thank it shouldn't you. bother you anymore, yeah. Thank you. So... We start with a quote of Henry Ford. Um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So this is if you, if you don't analyze the question properly that is asked, you always end up with the same solution. Floods and droughts, which are very uh, frequent in Chennai in more or less um, heavy condition, 
the default response are desalination plants and stormwater drains. And they both have the um, negative impact that they actually collect the water, but then bring it out to the sea as fast as possible. And then it has to be uh, gained back with desalination plants, which take a lot of energy. However, floods and droughts are interrelated. And we could also um, make a solution that actually looks into the context. So when it rains a lot um, in ancient history in Chennai, we had these so-called eries and the temple tanks, which would collect the rain from the monsoons. Uh, and then keep it and store it for later on during the rest of the year. Now in recent developments, all those lakes and areas have been built on and around two thirds of Chennai is sealed. We also see a lot of water pollution that is happening. That is this photo of the Mambalam Canal, uh, which is typical for very fast developing um, communities and a rapid urbanization that takes place. Now our project looks at, compares business as usual with a water balance model. In the business as usual, you see that the water indeed, it looks like an octopus. So it comes from far away, away tanks and far away desalination plants. It comes into the city, it's consumed, and for a large amount, it goes either untreated directly to the sea, or it uh, pollutes the already diminishing aquifer because so much water is pumped up that then seawater comes in and the situation is exacerbated with climate change. Now we make the hypothesis, how could we actually shrink this cycle? How could we shrink the water footprint in general? Because shrinking always means less consumption of energy. How could we connect to nature-based solutions which can treat and clean that water directly after consumption? so that we can recharge it clean into the aquifer and that we can actually recycle half of the water we use and half of the water we use is potable. So like this, the sea becomes cleaner and we much more sustainable with the use of resources. So that is what we call the systemic water balance model. All sustainability can actually only be achieved by turning all linear processes into cyclical processes. This is an interesting uh, statement from a cancer researcher, Swedish cancer resourcer, which coined the term of the cyclical processes. So if you'd like some more information, you can look into this. Um, so this is the typical model of a city everywhere around the world. So the city is this organism, it consumes a lot of resources. So we have here the water, but we could also replace it with materials um, or other resources. Um, so we see here how that comes in from far away, how it is consumed, and then how everything, uh, all the waste is actually also going out of the city again in a linear way. Uh, so that you have the sewage treatment plants, um, the trucks go outside. Um, so we compare this to a body where all the organs are placed outside the body, which you can understand is not very efficient. Um, and we try to uh, make an analogy between this externalized body and the body of the city and to achieve a paradigm shift by actually including everything that is, um, that is inside, uh, that is outside the city to include that inside the city to make it more efficient and to turn, to, to close the cycles within the city. Um, for, a human, uh, for human consumption, we approximately need uh, one point, so we have here a cycle where the water is consumed then we have a septic tank, we have constructed wetlands, and then from there it is recharged into the aquifer where it then can be cleaned again and it's uh, going into the cycle. Um, so here you see approximately the sizes that we need. Um, so we can, we can compare this um, the previous model, it's like a contained city, and the model we're looking of going towards is the isotropic city. The contained city depends on a relationship with the hinterlands, whereas in the isotropic city, it's fractal and expandable and it incorporates nature and solves all the problems locally. 
And this is how we developed the city of thousand tanks. We're offering an alternative to the business as usual um, that is cheaper to build and run, more environmentally friendly, has a tremendously smaller carbon footprint and is also more dependent on the local ecosystem. We see here uh, different types of uh, nature-based, so-called nature-based solutions that can help us in doing this job. On the left side here, we see the, the forest and the natural wetlands, which are the ideal condition of collecting rainwater and recharging it into the, into the aquifer. We then looked at how can we change this typology? How can we adapt it to the city so that we can use literally every surface in the city to collect water? So we go from roofs to wetlands, to recharge wells that can be placed everywhere, to open street uh, and space collection uh, that offer surfaces, um, to then have a runoff treatment with so-called bioswales, to then collect the water in new, new to be built tanks, historic tanks, and uh, renaturalized river and retention pockets. This is called uh, designing with nature-based solutions. So we have solutions in plants that help us treat the water. We have solutions in the soil. More than 80% of Chennai is favorable to recharge. Uh, it builds up from a clay layer to a mixed layer to a sand layer. So the recharge wells penetrate this layer so that uh, this water is stored here where it then can be pumped up again. And we have solutions in heritage. So this is cultural available solutions that already make Chennai originally into a very smart city. Uh, this is a section through an ancient temple tank. It functions a bit like an inverted pyramid. Um, so this is um, during dry season, then it starts to rain. Gradually this tank fills up and uh, releases the water into the first aquifer. Then it stabilizes the, pop, the communities around it, pump up the water. Just before the monsoon, the tank is empty. It can be cleaned, the silt can be removed, and the cycle can start again. Um, so now, yeah. To add a point to that, so the temple tanks were one uh, historically set up in places where you have the natural contour coming down to a location where water collection becomes ultimately easier. And at the same time, it becomes a religious and a social space that creates an engagement around itself. So settlements started developing around the temple tank. And the moment you have the depth of the temple tank that you see, where the bottom is scientifically assessed, where you say it goes until the sandy layer of the aquifer. So any amount of rain that pours down gets immediately sucked into the first aquifer zone. Now the first aquifer zone is the most sustainable water resource methodology because this is fed by the monsoon, by the rivers, by the lakes. They are constantly in connection with the ecological change of the surroundings. And extraction of water from this first layer is a sustainable loop because it is possible for us to refill it. But in the image, if you see, there is another aquifer layer which is below which is predominantly between the fissures of rocks at a very high depth. These aquifers have been created maybe thousands or millions of years ago by uh, where there was opening in the fissures within the rock. But these, what, these spaces cannot be filled with uh, water anymore because of the urbanization on top. So in historic sense, the aquifer, the first aquifer and the temple tank were extremely well thought through. And they were created not just as an instrument of water storage, but as a methodology for social engagement, creating a very intricate connection between water and society. So water becomes a component that is socially integrated into the life of people. Eva, carry on. Um, yes, and, and to add to that, actually, that right now the first aquifer is so diminished that many households have have bore wells that reach into the second aquifer that can never be filled up anymore. So the aim of the project is to really fill up this first aquifer so that the second aquifer is really a, a backup uh, solution that shouldn't be touched. Um, so here we see um, nature-based solutions and um, like green engineered ecosystems. 
and grey infrastructure next to each other. <laughs> and Lauren, I became co-host again, I think, <laughs> for some reason. Um, so we see as grey infrastructure, we see desalination plants, sewage treatment plants and stormwater drains that are all built with uh, high carbon impact uh, concrete, as you can see. And our hypothesis is that uh, green engineered solutions, nature-based solutions can do the same and more. They can take care of water sourcing, water treatment, flood protection, but as well sequester carbon, reduce methane, which is a lot um, in, in the open sewage. They can help soil production. They can be very valuable as fertilizers and they can prevent salinity intrusion. So you get the same, but more. So here we have, uh, we have put together a catalog of like uh, eight different measures that together form the toolbox that we work with. We have here the recharge wells. We have the, the recharge wells penetrate this clay layer and then reach out, reach out into this first aquifer. Then we have the bioswales, which convey the water and then relate to recharge wells uh, in other locations. We have the historic temple tanks. We have new built tanks. You have here um, an example from Bangkok. And then we have here the renaturalized river and canals. That is an example of the Ang Mo Kyo Park in Singapore. We also um, work with solid waste recycling because many of the current natural waterways are totally polluted with solid waste. So that is a mandatory um, given to take care of, otherwise we can never get the water clean. And then we have the constructed wetlands that can be integrated in the urban environment. They actually, they don't smell. They have a subsurface horizontal or vertical flow. So there is no standing water. There is no mosquitoes. And especially in warm regions, uh, such as in Chennai, where it is never below 20 degrees, they can be extremely efficient in treating wastewater with a very little uh, sludge left over afterwards. And then we have the adaptive buildings. So that means we change typologies of buildings so that they can already include many of these different measures and they become uh, by themselves more self-sufficient. And this is something that can be retrofitted in the, into the ex existing urban environment or that can be um, promoted with policies for buildings that are new or that are extended. Um, we would like now to show you our four flagship projects that we developed. The whole program has a, has a, has a program, as it says, a City of Thousand Thanks program. And then we try to get more concrete with four flagship projects. And in the end, we will also show you a pilot project that we're currently working on to kick off the, the, the whole story. So we use nature-based solutions for four different targets, flood prevention, drought prevention, sanitation, and an improved urban environment. You see here again a summary of the eight different measures. And we now apply this to the city of uh, Chennai, which is 7 million people. We chose uh, four very specific watersheds to apply and to test these solutions. Um, so you see here again the same image. So one is a social housing site, one is the historic temple site, one is one of the largest uh, open water canals in the city, the Mambalam Canal, and one is the Koyambedu market area, which is synonymous for industries. The first project, uh, the Mailapur Trail, looks at especially uh, exactly what Shailesh was describing, um, the cultural um, heritage and how we can uh, regain this ancient knowledge that got lost on the way. We have some temple tanks that actually are either dry, uh, some of them even got uh, ground concreted so that they pretend there's a, a, a water level in the tank but that it's, it's only a cosmetic function. And our project here now tries to link up all the area which is blocked 
and to reopen the connection so that the tank can fill up, but that we can also in this watershed, we can, we can bring as much water through um, constructed wetlands, through bioswales, through adaptive buildings into the ground. So you see here a cut through the Kabbalah tank. Shailish, if you want to add something, you just uh, jump in. So, um, Mailapo happens to be one of the most important uh, zones in Chennai. It is in par, you can say it as one of the oldest settlements that had uh, been a part of even before the creation of the city, even before the British occupation of uh, India. And Mailapur has a very unique way it has developed in relation to the city. So the tank that you see in the previous image, that is the Kapalishka tank, which is a very large water body, that is a water hold with a very huge water holding capacity in the middle of the city. And uh, there were historic settlements around it. And this was a principal observatory for the amount of water the settlement would have. So as you see right now, what has happened in this tank is uh, you, the bottom of the tank has been created in such a way that the clay layer of 1.2 meters, which was uh, intentionally done so that the water that is available on top is there is some amount of water available on top for the social functions of the temple. Now, since the depth of the tank is exactly in relation to the uh, sandy aquifer, any amount of rain pours in the water directly drains down into the aquifer, raising the water table of the entire community. So it had been a very effective mechanism for the society to actually see the water as a barometer visible in front of their eyes to know how much amount of water is actually available for the community to consume. So during the peak summer, when the water in the temple tank goes down, the community realized subconsciously or as a part of their social system that their consumption of water has to be reduced to match to the availability of water. So that's the level of uh, synchronized lifestyle that had existed historically with temple tanks, not just in Mailapo, but any other temple tank where there is a settlement around it. This, this visual connection, water, available water for consumption and how it defines the day-to-day -day life was a very, very, very important social connect. As a team, what we realized is this connection between water and livelihood and knowing what is available for us to actually consume and work with has been dismantled over in the past, uh, let's say, four, four to five decades. So that has been one of the significant impacts that has been uh, become the biggest problem of the city, where we don't relate to the water and we are not held responsible for the water that is available. And the water as a system is being pumped from outside the city. So people's connection to the water source is also diminished. And their responsibility to maintain the water source and be uh, frugal in using it during summer times is also reduced. So the city has become kind of uh, indifferent sponge that absorbs water from the surrounding because it doesn't relate to it as a part of its ecosystem. And that is the beauty of the stand and that is the beauty of the setup. And what we are trying to do is bring that, bring that sense of relationship between water and livelihood back into the urban fabric in the existing condition and how best our nature-based system can be tailored to create this perspective. Well, yeah, and so um, originally also we have the, the rainwater, um, as you can see here in this image, and so we, we, we're channeling the rainwater with new bioswales all around the temple so that it then goes into recharge wells where it then recharges this aquifier and it shows, so the level here shows in the temple tank. Now the rain only comes down during two months a year, whereas the uh, gray and black water from all the city that's surrounding it, that's now obviously much larger than a village, what it used to be, that is available 12 months a year. And that's a very, very large amount of water that is now just collected and, and partly treated, but partly not treated. And so we think it is necessary in the current condition of climate change, where droughts are more frequent, to look into this resource of uh, gray and black water and to look at ways to also make this to some extent visible, but in a way that we don't see it as waste, what we see it as a resource that also enables us to beautify the streets. So we have here constructed wetlands that are visible. 
um, so they become they, they you know they become part of the notion of what a city should be they're not somewhere hidden outside and here the same same way we can clean that water recharge it so we don't reuse it directly but we use also the extra treatment through the aquifer before we eventually uh, would recharge that and to add uh, to that we also work with the existing street sections and when we started designing we realized that there is actually ample amount of space so it's really about organizing the space effectively so all all stakeholders in which even nature is a stakeholder can benefit uh, from the proposal yeah so we we actually ran um, also research with the street vendors and how the street vendors uh, that occupy this, which have always a lack of toilets and 80% of the street vendors are women, which suffer from this lack of toilets. So how we can, at the same time as we create this change, how we can involve them in the making of this space uh, to, to uh, reskill, uh, to help building these nature-based solutions, but at the same time offer them also facilities so the street vendors can, um, can have uh, showers, toilets, etc. Uh, as part of this project. Second project is uh, Chitronaga. It is a housing community of around 10,000 uh, people that live next to the Adya River. They just live behind a dike that you can see here and they were extremely hit uh, by the flood in 2015, right? And so we see here all that water from the neighborhoods that runs into this community here. And very quickly, you can see that here, it starts to be around three meter high. So the first floor of this community is completely covered with water. Even with the slightest rainwater, it is immediately one feet. And what you can see here just starting is a community is, is a slum, which immediately get hit with the slightest rain. So here we look into, um, into uh, two things, like one, preventing the water from running down into this community. So that means uh, creating reforested streets that can retain more water in the upper neighborhoods um, and creating adaptive buildings within this neighborhood and creating, um, creating floods, dedicated flood zones. So this is new tanks which can absorb a lot of water in a flood uh, situation. Nilofat, do you want to say something about this? Uh, so Yes, uh, so uh, with our um, uh, team, we have conducted uh, multiple focus group discussions, which we use as a, a very prominent methodology uh, to engage with the citizens and also understand what their needs, what the problems and what their aspirations are. And this was, this was one of the results of our study uh, in which we, we found out that 60% of all vulnerability is related to water and sanitation. So we, we uh, found out that uh, most uh, women and children do not have access to a toilet, which means that they are very much at risk uh, um, um, to different kinds of uh, um, violence. And uh, we also realized that um, a lot of women uh, pump water every single uh, day, about four hours, because they do not have any running water in their houses, which means that they have to go to a, a local public Hand, uh, hand pump zone and uh, pump out water. So that is four hours per day. And uh, all this really um, uh, contrib uh, contributes a lot to their vulnerability because then it also means that with more flooding, there is more risk of diseases. Uh, there is not enough uh, uh, spaces for them to congregate for them. Uh, there's not enough public space. Uh, it's, uh, so it really uh, puts them at a lot of risk to different kinds of impacts of both floods and droughts. So we made a plan that is actually looking at um, retrofitting the area with around 30% more housing to create zones on top of the existing housing that can then serve as a retreat if there's a flood condition so people don't actually have to leave their houses but they can seek refuge on the roof. You see here these uh, detention park 
uh, which is a large uh, zone of a playground, for instance, that then can be flooded. You see urban forestry, you see the renaturalized bund. We have floating islands that can treat wastewater. We have uh, vegetable gardens and we have constructed wetlands and we have uh, public uh, toilets. So that is the same in uh, rain in a, in a flood condition where you see here that this can temporarily completely change. It turns into a dynamic landscape that can be flooded. It can then retain that water and gradually give it into the aquifer. We have here the current situation right now in the backyard of the houses which have um, which are totally deteriorated and we could actually prove with our calculations that we can turn this neighborhood into a self-sufficient neighborhood where the community can take care of their own um, water treatment with constructed wetlands in the back. So space-wise, this all works out. We have the third project, which is the green, in part of the Green Industries Program. Uh, the flagship project is placed in Coyambedo, which is one of the city's largest uh, perishable goods markets with around $200,000 million turnover. 85% um, of all surfaces are currently impervious and we want to improve the absorption capacity um, so that groundwater levels that have faced a severe decline over the years around it can be again pushed up and maintained and that the industry, which is really um, going down and crippled during floods, that this can be more steadily maintained. So we have here that is uh, on a much larger scale. We have here one of the la largest sewage treatment plants in Chennai that can be, uh, we add a whole bio, uh, a sort of bio um, treatment park to it. We add bioswales to the bus station, we renaturalize the river Korm, and we make all the tracks, the metro tracks here for the metro depot, completely absorbent. Fourth project is the uh, Mambalam Arms project, part of the Smart Waterways program. Here we're looking at a very large area of around 1,200 hectares and around uh, almost 400,000 beneficiaries in the city. Um, the Mambalam drain, as it is currently called, is an extremely polluted um, waterway that most of the time is stuck. And we figured out that this, um, the floods that occur here are not because of water that comes from the Adya River, but of local water. So here we try to make the Mambalam Arms project. So to across the whole watershed of the Mambalam area to introduce um, various uh, um, streets that can absorb the water. And we have little tanks that uh, can absorb, that can be for instance, playgrounds, basketball fields, etc. Um, backyards that can absorb the water and help recharge the aquifer. This is a picture of the current situation along the Mabalam Canal, where um, typically you also have a lot of social housing that is situated here. And this is the situation after the refurbishment where constructed wetlands, they help uh, clean that water here directly, but they also help then to maintain a steady water condition uh, in between the monsoons. We have a meandering canal that is much more naturalized, that invites people, um, that invites uh, even tourism. We have here floating islands inside the river and renaturalized edges. Uh, so that improves the business conditions next to the canal. We can add new housing and we refurbish the existing housing and make it more adaptive to one or the other flood that might occur. So again, uh, you can see here the dynamic landscape that starts to appear by bringing nature inside the city. We then looked at the impact of the whole program and how one flagship project that reaches a certain amount of beneficiaries. So this here, for instance, is the Mylapore program. 
where we work with a number of the components, how much recharge that can give and how much recharge we can reach when we look at all the 53 historic tanks that are spread across the city. Um, so we made calculations of the rain and MLD, that is the unit million liters per day. Uh, so the recharge per year is then recalculated as a day um, limit. So we have here the Thousand Tanks um, Heritage Program. Then we have the Disaster Resilient Housing, where we start with Chitronaga, where we look at bioswales, constructed wetlands and adaptive buildings. And we look at the upscaling across 20 flood-prone sites with uh, economically weaker section housing in Chennai. Then we look at the Green Industries program that starts with Koyambedu and then spreads across another 40 sites. And we look at the Smart Waterways program in Mambalam um, that then can reach almost the whole, I mean, a third of the city with 5 million beneficiaries and 800 million liter per day recharge capacity. So these figures are, yeah. Sorry, so the, the beauty of this approach is, um, one, we are looking at a historic uh, aspect of the city and uh, how one way of water management has been a social condition. Another one, we are looking at uh, places which are social housing, which are decrepit, which have, which is considered to be one of the largest problems the city is facing in terms of flooding, providing water for the people and maintaining sanitation conditions. And the industrial zones, which again become a very difficult uh, environment for management and maintenance. And uh, yeah, so and last, the drains. So most of the drains inside the city, because Chennai is a flat terrain and uh, we predominantly depend on the monsoon rain, there is this uh, uh, there is this urban uh, flooding that happens because of the amount of ground, uh, non-porous ground that we have. So the drains become a very critical, play a critical role during monsoon in in taking water towards the sea. So the idea is we have taken all the problems that the city is currently facing and we are trying to convert it into potential solutions that actually benefit the city back. And not by changing them, not by completely uh, removing them out of the context, but giving a new condition a new way of looking at it and a new completely different integration within the city itself. So this was one of the greatest uh, things that we had discovered. So it, it's not that you need to find a new solution for any of the existing problems. It's just that if you look at the problem from a different perspective, it offers a million new ways in which it could benefit the community, benefit the city and benefit the country as a whole. I just wanted to add that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is that is very important that often looking looking back in history can give us clues because that's how culture, how the culture grew and how the culture is linked to the climate and how the culture is linked to the soil conditions and 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 the way of doing things. And of course, the city is not what it used to be hundred years ago or five hundred years ago. So we have to engineer the solution and that comes back that we can we can have nature by understanding what nature really does and how nature can help us in solving our problems and by actually integrating the cycles of nature into the city um, and allowing it space and engineering it so we have to really make that actively to get what is called the ecosystem services inside the city um, so that is everything overlaid, uh, which combined could give around 1,400 million liter per day recharge. And that is absolutely comparable to desalination plants, which produce anything between, I think, 100 and um, uh, 400 MLD recharge uh, per day. Uh, not recharge, but water provision. Water supply. Yeah, exactly, water, water supply. So as we start to, to speak, we understand also that the flow of water means also a flow of money. Um, so we started to analyze all the flows that will happen as the city grow and how we could compare business as usual with a water balance model. 
that we have been developing. So in the middle, we see here the urban demand. This is already a, a, a prospective view around 2030. Chennai is supposed to grow a lot to um, around 15 million people in the larger metropolitan region of Chennai. Mm -hmm. So that would mean the city has around, around 3000 MLD demand. Um, this demand will then lead to a, to a, a production of wastewater and the production of wastewater will have to either be taken care of by the sewage treatment station or it leads to a pollution. Uh, it will also mean that a lot of water needs to be extracted and that a lot of water will be coming from desalination. The more water is uh, consumed from desalination, the more uh, wastewater also will be produced and will be, need to will be uh, needed to treat. And the more groundwater deficit is occurring over time because most of the rainfall that you can see here currently with stormwater, with the stormwater network is brought out to the sea and goes to waste. Now in the water balance model that uh, we have been developing, we see that part of that rainfall water, so not all, but a good part is uh, recharged, around 1000 MLD is recharged into the ground, um, and 100% of the wastewater is clean. So that, that is what is really changing with either sewage treatment stations, with nature-based solutions um, in situ, uh, distributed all over the city. So not somewhere outside, but within the city, we're solving the problem then that means we can increase the extraction within the city with decentralized water treatment uh, stations that then can be run by Metro Water who has a better um, system so that more people can actually be supplied for the Metro Water system and have to limit, can limit the water use of private borewells. And you see here the difference in desalination of 2000 to 750 MLD, and that is already existing and in the pipeline. And then we also compare the operational costs of the business as usual model to the water balance model. Um, in the business as usual model, where more than 2000 MLD come from the desalination plants, we have uh, rising costs over the years, around 1.5 billion operational costs per year, because also water transport with water trucks, uh, commercial water costs, all this adds up and is very expensive. And ultimately, it is the user who is going to pay this. So that's why we call it here the water cost to society. Whereas if we take nature-based solutions, which are practically doing the job for free, they just need to be also maintained and operated just as the more gray infrastructure solutions. We can reduce the operational costs uh, per year by half. 50%. Then we look at the carbon emissions. We compare again business as usual with the water balance model. And we see here that the desalination plants, they are around 2.4 million tons of carbon per year. So altogether, this adds up to 3.8. We have the water trucks. Uh, we have the methane from the open sewage. So all that is avoided and actually even sequestered with the nature-based solutions. So overall, we have a, a, an infinitely smaller carbon footprint from water within the city. And then we looked at the citywide benefits to property, to enabling business, to health, water savings, which is a total of around 900,000 900 million dollar per year. So just to pick out a few, um, we have around 32 million uh, dollar less property, public property damage. So that is government benefits, that is in floods, uh, the roads get damaged and have to be repaired. We have more productivity with water sourcing. Um, so that means drought prevention. So that is the story that Nilofer told that actually the working time of around 2,500 women already accounts for $4 million per year if they only paid $1 per hour. And we have less uh, health costs from a lack of sanitation where people fall sick 
and they don't have running water at home, which now in times of COVID-19 becomes even more important because you cannot ask people to wash their hands if they don't have running water at home. So overall, the cost comparison, uh, can, you can see it here, between the capital um, expenditure cost and the operational expenditure cost um, per year per MLD. And we can see here that uh, nature-based solutions are around 25% less than the desalination plant, and in operational costs, they're around 50% less. We then looked, because in the program, uh, water is leveraged, we had, we had also next to the local meetings, we had meetings in Singapore, where we met up with the uh, international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the Green Climate Funds. So we looked at how could a solution like this become uh, financeable. So we have uh, nature-based solutions on private properties and we have nature-based solutions on public properties. For the public properties, the uh, money rains, as it were, uh, this is sort of a money cloud uh, from the international financial institutions onto the Tamil Nadu government, who can with that money then implement um, bioswales, constructed wetlands, forests, etc., within the city. And we have local financing institutions which give a loan to private property owners to build their own recharge wells. We then have a revenue and payback mechanism that is equivalent to what we know also from solar energy, for instance. So um, with that water, the Tamil Nadu government would they give subsidies to Metro Water, who then would give contracts to local NBS operators to operate the public property nature-based solutions. Through that, the groundwater is increased, the water assets, as it were, increase, and Metro Water has um, more water sales than before. Uh, it also has then a better tax revenue. And with these increased water sales, Metro Water can pay back the Tamil Nadu government, which then can pay back the international financial institutions. Metro Water can also give a feed-in tariff to private property owners, where the recharge would be monitored with remote um, sensors. So that is, uh, let's say, we combine smart technology with the uh, natural technology and with that feed-in tariff then the private property owners could back the local financing institutions. So then we looked also into governance and civic engagement and I think Nilofer you can explain yeah. here what uh, how we looked mm -hmm. at that on the uh, scale level from India until yeah. the Greater Chennai Corporation. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, governance and, and uh, civic engagement was also one of uh, the important pillars of the project. And in order to really uh, facilitate an enabling environment for all our proposals uh, to, be, to become a reality, governance was a very important aspect uh, of our project. So first we began with trying to understand the complexity of how the institutional structure in Chennai, Tamil Nadu and India works. So the idea was to really be able to facilitate horizontal and vertical uh, integration of the institution. So vertical meant that from the central government to the state government, to the metropolitan region, and, and then eventually to the city, how would this um, uh, sort of uh, feedback uh, between the different levels of government work? And horizontal integration was between different departments which are cu currently working in Chennai, they are, they are currently quite siloed, which means that they do not work in an integrated manner. And how can we uh, create different kinds of enabling environments which can facilitate horizontal integration of different uh, departments of the government? So uh, we used, uh, uh, so in order to design different kinds of water governance principles and eventually implement uh, it in, in Chennai, we used the OECD principles on water governance as a base which uh, defines different kinds of principles uh, to make governance, uh, local governance effective, efficient, and to also build trust and engagement. So when we uh, designed it according to our project, we created nine principles. Uh, so with respect to effectiveness, we have capacity building both on an institutional and a civic level. 
we have program based collaboration and program uh, project based collaboration and program based coordination which meant that multi scalar projects across different levels of government and also different spatial scales can work together then we have watershed governance uh, in city of thousand tanks in which we try to understand how watershed boundaries and administrative boundaries can sometimes be in conflict with each other and how then we could facilitate uh, governance between spatial versus institutional uh, boundaries. With efficiency, we looked at the City of Thousand Tanks dashboard, which was all about creating evidence, uh, data, and also putting up all the research from on ground and building a knowledge base and making it accessible to the institution as well as uh, the beneficiaries. Learning from local culture in City of Thousand Tanks, which was to really reveal and uncover different kinds of aspects of the local Tamil culture and to really uh, build on that in order to improve uh, uh, ownership and also how much people relate with the project. And uh, number six was the City of Thousand Tanks experiment in which we, uh, we try to set up local examples and local experiments in which we can set up different kinds of field trials on the ground, test out our solutions in order to really make them as efficient uh, in terms of functionality. And with respect to trust and engagement, we looked at City of Thousand Tanks local heroes to really pick out and highlight different local efforts, different sort of champions uh, on the ground who are already conducting different kinds of um, experiments on the ground and to give them a platform to really scale up uh, the different efforts. City of Thousand Tanks awareness campaign, which was a full-fledged awareness campaign with public art, events, uh, different kinds of cultural um, uh, events, uh, social media campaign, uh, focus group discussions, engagement, participation, etc., to really make the idea land on the ground and to really maximize how much people take ownership towards it. And finally, the City of Thousand Tanks platform, which was to enable a transparent uh, um, mode of communication in which um, both the government as well as the beneficiaries can interact with each other. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so then I think we have to, probably also it's almost three o'clock, I see. We have to. Um, yeah, we will, yeah. <laughs> speed That's up a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to quickly run through this, uh, there were two uh, achievements that we have been able to, um, uh, which, which, we, which we want to highlight in this presentation. So first is uh, that we have been able to set up the first water alliance in Chennai, and that meant that we have brought different kinds of stakeholders from government, from finance, from uh, the, uh, the non-governmental sector, civic sector, et cetera, to come together and facilitate a dialogue uh, between them. So here we see from one of our workshops in which people from different parts of, uh, from different departments of the government came together in one room and that was quite an incredible uh, feat. Uh, in this uh, image, we see how we use innovative stakeholder techniques to really um, facilitate this dialogue further. Uh, the money on the table uh, 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 method that we used. And finally, how it was extremely inclusive to all groups of community, including the vulnerable groups, in order to understand what their needs and aspirations are. The second, uh, um, the second uh, achievement would be how we redefine participation in urban practice and how we really uh, uh, highlighted participation in, in uh, urban strategy making. So working with the vulnerable communities, um, also setting up different uh, mediums in which we display our projects to the beneficiaries and create a feedback mechanism with them. And um, and also involve different age groups. Uh, so this is an image uh, from a drawing competition organized for children in which they express how their uh, dream settlement would be. And we really, uh, what one of the key takeaways was that um, everybody prioritizes non-polluted environments. Everybody prioritizes green in their habitats. So this was quite a, a, a nice revelation for us to also see where priorities uh, lie and how we could uh, design for it. So here you see how the whole uh, program is uh, set up in time uh, and how everything feeds into the Thousand Tanks program and how we organize the different steps. So this was the water as leverage program during nine months. Then we have a phase of feasibility, uh, pre-feasibility with field trials, then the flagships, the pioneer program and the city norm. 
right now we are somewhere in this phase and we started to work on a pilot project in the PS school uh, next to the Mylapur tank. Shalesh, do you want to with me? Yeah. yeah, so the ground that you see right now and the tank that you see on the top of the image is the Kabbalishwar tank that we initially spoke about. So the idea of choosing the school is one, it is historically old, about 150 years old, one of the first institutions that was created for local empowerment and uh, it is in close proximity to the existing uh, tank and the cultural aspects of the entire myla post stretches along this corridor and added on to that this has this school has in its vicinity a large playground available uh, which is currently being used only for sports activities but on a on a on a deeper note we thought this could be an ideal ground for us to see the thought of how open spaces could transform into public spaces, used spaces, as well as the uh, environment which actually captures waters and stores them and, uh, and uh, converts it into usable resource for us. So this was the hub that we chose as a demonstration because of its, its centrality and considering Mylapur to be one of our three key areas for our flagship uh, project to be rooted, we thought engaging with the school and the community through the, through the, the school trust and through the, uh, the, the associations that are as part of the school, we get a larger framework, we get a larger audience who we can directly impact. And by putting the technically feasible, in, uh, the nature-based systems inside the school ground, we can prove the results and we can actually bring a perspective of what we are speaking as in terms of nature-based systems and how easily feasible they are inside dense urban fabric like Mylapo and how they would add value to the existing system as a whole. So the design is quite simple. You have a large playground where we are trying to bring the wastewater from the school. We are trying to redesign the toilet facility so that it upgrades the facility for the school and at the same time create innovative ways in which we can make the children learn how water management is a critical part and how water as a resource, even though it is a waste, could be brought back into use. And we have uh, wastewater treatment systems in the form of uh, bio, uh, in the form of uh, constructed wetland. And we have bioswales and a detention park, which in a normal time becomes an interesting play area for the children. But during the monsoon, it actually fills up to hold the water that is required to be uh, recharged into the ground. And on the above the ground, the part of this land belongs to a uh, government department called HRT, Hindu Religious Endowment Trust, which is the temple owning body. Here we are trying to put up a, a, a garden, a flower garden, which will actually become a revenue model for the temple. And at the same time, have water being stored and uh, taken onto the ground through recharge. Yeah. Eva? Yeah. And yeah. this is our efforts on ground for the last, uh, before the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown. So we had went to the, we had been at the school, we had spoken to all the trustees. Now we have mapped the entire sewage system. We have uh, dredged and cleaned the existing systems. And this is a very critical point. Inside the playground, there is a, there is a, uh, a stone culvert which takes the water directly to the Kapalishura tank. So this is our efforts where we have made, we have brought, uh, we have brought testing uh, units inside the school. We have tested the water quality. So we have real time data on the quality of water and the amount of water that is being consumed by the school. And the systems are being designed to scale to match these needs. So yeah, that's that's the physical work that we have started on at ground. And so this uh, last uh, diagram here that shows the upscaling possibility, the ripple effect and the transformative potential of the whole program. So how we want to grow from one school pilot where we prove the techniques, but we, which we can also use for capacity building, for knowledge building, for inclusive engagement and to anchor our social media campaign, how we can use that for the Thousand Tanks program to then build the flagship project and the city of Thousand Tanks but how this can also be connected to the current Chal Shakti Abhijan program and how that can grow to other schools, to schools all over India to engage uh, up to 260 million students. Um, so to uh, come to a close, uh, this is another image of our team of the collaboration between Dutch and, um, and, and uh, Chennai. 
and um, and this is uh, our last image with uh, which we want to close off the the lecture today. Thank you very much um, to all of our speakers. Um, I really enjoyed the the connection to the historic and social aspects in the city. You don't see that as often as one would hope in projects like this. Um, we just have a few brief questions um, from some of the participants that maybe we can quickly cover before um, we can continue the rest of our days. Um, Peter asked, is there a policy for private water boreholes in Chennai? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Is there a policy? Um, for private water boreholes. So uh, the usage there, of that. There is an act which uh, which says that every borehole has to be taken uh, with prior permissions from the government, but that's a practice that's not being followed. And uh, private boreholes are boreholes inside private property. It's a common phenomenon. And uh, almost, I would say, a major share of the city's water demand comes from these private boreholes. And they are not managed and they are not monitored as well. Thank you. Um, and then Sarah um, pointed out, or also questioned, um, she said she's not familiar with how uh, Kenai's municipal finance structure worked, um, but was interested to know whether reduced costs and therefore reduced user fees uh, don't increase the city's overall expenditure budget and therefore indirectly affect service delivery. Um, um. Yeah, Charles, do you want to go first? Yeah, so the thing is, yeah, we we are thinking about, I say, the answer for the question is 100 steps from now. At this point of time, we don't have a methodology for water management. So we, it's very important that as a city, we feel responsible for the water that we use, and it's not an infinite resource that we have. And that is something that we have to bring into perspective. The water management methodology, yes, we are still refining it. We, are, we have come to a conclusion that there is immense potential if we manage our water for the city to actually make it, uh, make it uh, profitable and provide those subsidies back to the most important uh, required people of the community. And it's very much feasible and possible. But this is, as I said, 100 steps from now. First, we need to come to a point where we actually understand there is surplus water that is available as a part of the city. And if we manage it properly, we don't need to have this, this 250 kilometer source of water coming into the city to feed us. I think yeah, that we, is, yeah, you are. Now, on the other hand, what, what I can see from that question is like the crucial question, which is uh, on a global level, we, we want to achieve degrowth but degrowth doesn't pay off because, for instance, the banks are not really interested in degrowth. And um, so, so the question is really how can, let's say, without water and without food, we, we cannot live. That's exactly what proved to be essential now in the crisis uh, we are in. So how can we actually localize also this, this um, water provision, uh, water treatment, so that people, for instance, in the social neighborhood could actually run their own system or actually co-manage it at least. So have some financial gain, some economic benefit by creating jobs. So localize uh, that system and then eventually free funds in the city budget for other very important programs. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to see that on a larger scale where then budgets that are saved can be used immediately for other things, to improve uh, the social housing because then you have to make investments to make that happen. But we could see in the whole process that this is exactly the sort of painful part that savings and uh, not everybody is interested in savings necessary. The people which are interested are the end users. So that's where we have to start negotiating this new model uh, into a demand-based uh, model. Great, thank you. Um, and then just maybe two last final questions here. Um, also from Peter, apart from the finance and government policy alignment, uh, what are the major challenges to be tackled to make this work, if any? Uh, there's a lot. I don't think we can say one or two, but 
I'll say one. Uh, I'll say a piece of information for that. So the wastewater uh, is managed by a department in the government called Metro Water. The storm water is managed by a department which is managed by the corporation, uh, the Chennai Greater City Corporation, which is also a public entity but a different department. And the uh, waterways, the rivers that are running through, is managed by the public works department. Now, you have this is just the the the, the tip of the iceberg. So. There is a number of people who are associated with water and they are functioning in a completely dislocated methodology. And one of the greatest thing that we understood in this project is there is a large amount of land that is available for us to have these systems put in place. But access to that land becomes the most critical component because one department would not align with the other department's perspective. And how do you draw this line? How do they come together and agree on terms and conditions? How do we actually make this happen? That is I would say one of the most uh, or the biggest problem that we are kind of finding our way through. We have been successfully able to bring on board the Metro Water Corporation. PWD is still on the on the edges, but still bringing those two big departments into one conversation was a year's effort. So this is one of the biggest challenges to bring people together. Yeah, and to add to that also. Uh, yeah. One of the other challenges would be about really uh, building acceptance on the ground level because uh, people have currently lost that connection with water as once used to be in in uh, in historic or traditional times, and uh, that's why we also really uh, look at engagement and really trying to revive people's relationship with water and how they can relook at their own history and just uh, become more accustomed uh, to the visibility of water in everyday life. Yeah, I would, I would also say that the biggest challenge overall is to convince everybody who is implicated that another reality is possible, that we can move from a scarcity model to an abundance model if we join forces. So that, let's say, if there is something in this for everybody and then to go to every party and convince them one by one. So the communication is a huge amount of work and is, is also what we put right now the most effort in, in communicating that it is a possible alternative and that it's worthwhile looking into. Thank you for those. Um, and then just one final question um, was about the pollution in the waterways. Um, are there any plans to tackle the issues of post renaturalization of the waterways? Yes, <clears throat> we're working with the Paperman Foundation. Uh, this, he's uh, Matthew, he's part of our consortium, and he has a specific recycling program, especially for the plastic waste. Eventually, we hope that plastic waste will also decrease, but right now it is there and it needs to be taken care of. A lot of the waste that we see in the Mambalam Canal is actually dumped there by trucks at night because it's already a dump. And so let's say as we get that gradually clean, also this perception from a drain into a canal, into a waterway will change and prevent people with more social uh, sort of um, acceptance that this, this, can, this can change. But yeah, we have, th this is what one of the components that we work with, mm -hmm. recycling of waste. Great. Well, um, we won't keep anyone else up. Um, thank you very much for everyone for joining us today. And thank you very much for our speakers and your very interesting projects that you're working on. Um, we, the recording of this will be available on the Water Youth Network um, YouTube channel, which will be shared on our social media. Um, and I've also shared some of the other uh, websites if you're interested in the chat. Um, Without further ado, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.